In the last eight months, we've witnessed massacre of civilians in Palestine. The Israeli war, which started with Hamas terrorist attack on um, southern um, Israel, which resulted over a thousand uh, people who lost their lives, um, was continued by the uh, Israeli government military operation, uh, unparalleled military operation in Gaza. We've witnessed over 37,000 people who've lost their lives. Uh, over 80,000 people who are reported of, are injured severely. 60% of those killed are women and children. And over 50% of Gaza is uninhabitable. Water, electricity, medical supplies, everything has been banned entering Gaza. There are um, war information management by Israel and many media on one hand, and on the other hand, by the, Islam by, by the terrorists, Hamas and Islamist groups. The reality is that the world is horrified by this situation. And we've seen that in reaction across the globe and the demand for this war to end. And this desire is not only globally, also in Palestine, in Middle East, in Israel, in many, many different countries, and people want this war to end. But the reality is that neither Hamas nor the Islamic Israeli government want this war to end. This is a God-given situation for both of them to be able to survive and extend their influence. And they have been backed by, really disgracefully, by the, uh, the Western governments and, and, and the media. The moral question is, what do we do? None of these, uh, none of these sides of this conflict uh, have a moral position. They cannot be supported. On the one hand, you have the Islamist groups headed by Hamas in, in Gaza and in a region in, in Lebanon by Hezbollah and the Islamic regime of Iran. On the other hand, you have the Israeli uh, forces, which have used the most brutal uh, military tactic against the civilians backed by the Western uh, media and mis Western military support, both military and politically. The situation is unacceptable. There must be an alternative, and there is an alternative. There is an alternative that people of uh, the world really demand for the war initially to end, and is it possible there is an easy solution. There are seven and a half million Palestinians, seven and a half million Israelis, they should be able to live in peace if it wasn't for the extremist religious groups and the Western interests globally who want this war to continue. No, I think, yeah, definitely uh, for me, I find it outrageous when we see some people, let's say Iranian monarchists, for example, raising the Israeli flag at a time when there is genocide. Uh, you know, we're seeing genocide unfolding uh, in the Palestinian territories by the Israeli state. And also we have uh, those who are pro-Palestinian, rightly so, but raising the Hamas flag. Again, you know, for me, I think this is such a morally bankrupt politics, siding with one terrorist versus another terrorist. Both kill at will human life of the other, the other side is completely meaningless and worthless and we hear that propaganda on both sides. You know, if, if Israel is co committing genocide, killing tens of thousands of people within a few months, it's because the, it's an act of self-defense. Who knew that self-defense is massacring women, children and men and uh, annihilating uh, an entire population, decimating entire population? Who knew that was an act of self-defense? That's, that's news to me new definition for self-defense in, in the dictionary. And on the other hand, you've got, you know, um, Hamas attacking Israel and people calling it diamonds in the sky, their, their missiles. And, uh, you know, it was an act of resistance, they say, when they go and massacre music goers and concert goers and innocent civilians, uh, raping, uh, pillaging, you know, that that's... that's um, a reaction supposedly to Israeli occupation, as if such inhuman acts can ever be legitimized for any reason. And so I think really uh, 
a moral position is one that takes sides with neither side, neither the Israeli state nor Hamas and uh, the Islamists. Both are just inhuman and should not be supported. And we, we should stand up to both sides unequivocally. Part of this war, really what we've witnessed is the information war. On the one hand, you'll see that the Islamists try to hide behind the Palestinian cause, legitimate cause of the Palestinians, against the Israeli occupation and massacre of the civilians. On the other hand, we'll see the right-wing media and right-wing groups and governments and states in the West trying to support the Israeli uh, government and the actions. And this is really, really makes a lot of people angry and it's important to pay attention to this propaganda and disinformation. In this propaganda war that we are seeing, of course, uh, there's uh, one example that I'd like to raise, which is that of the political commentator Bill Maher. Uh, when he was criticizing the students who are standing up for Palestinians against genocide, he was saying, well, you know, kiddies, if you want to focus on apartheid, why don't you focus on gender apartheid or sex apartheid? Uh, because that's something that's affecting a lot of women. And I'm glad that, you know, people are remembering the issue of sex apartheid and gender apartheid. Um, and of course, you know, myself, I'm a signatory of a campaign that's calling on sex apartheid to be recognized as a crime against humanity in the same way that racial apartheid is. But nonetheless, just because there is sex apartheid doesn't mean that no other apartheid exists. And I think one of the things we need to be clear about is what is apartheid? Apartheid means that you categorize civilians or the or citizens into different categories. And based on those categories, you give people different rights and different treatments. What is the Israeli state other than an apartheid state? It's blatantly clear for anyone that doesn't want to play politics and wants to look at the facts. If you look at the facts, you see that citizens, even within Israel, are treated differently if they are not Jewish. There are differences in every section of social life, whether it's in housing, whether it's in health, the way uh, Palestinians are treated in uh, the law, the way they are treated in the right to movement, to be able to lease land or to buy land. In every aspect of one's life, there is different treatment, discriminatory treatment, if you are a Palestinian Arab versus if you are Jewish. And one, let me just give you one example of uh, treatment in the Palestinian territories. If you are a Jewish settler, that's a very nice way of calling someone who's an occupier. If you're a Jewish settler in the Palestinian territories, and if you're ever tried or prosecuted, I, who knows if that ever happens, unlikely since it's part of Israeli government policy, but you would be tried according to Israeli civil law. But if you're a Palestinian living in the Palestinian territories, you will be tried by military law. Different treatment for different people. That is the very essence of an apartheid system. Um, the, the other issue that I find really, just really bugs me is the fact that people will call Israel a democratic state. The very same people that are always upset and always critical, as I am, of Islamic states. How can an Islamic state be democratic? Yet a Jewish state can be democratic? It's impossible. And I think that clearly, the fact that it is a Jewish state, that any Jewish person anywhere in the world has the right to return to Israel, never been to Israel, never been to the Palestinian territories, never been to the Middle East. They have a right to return, but people whose families are from that area don't have that right to return. So again, you know, this propaganda um, really is very telling. Um, I agree that this propaganda is really, really telling, you know, the judiciary system. So many Palestinians, innocent Palestinians are arrested and put in detention without any recourse to any defense. 
They are spent, they're tortured, they are raped. There are evidence of rape, torture, inhuman treatment of the Palestinians in administrative detention, which is no law governs it. They, they can't have a defense. I, uh, I bumped into an Israeli in, in a meeting early on in, in London, and he was so upset about the treatment of the Palestinians. He said, I was arrested on a peace march in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, and... I was in prison for three weeks, but I had access to lawyers. I managed to defend myself and I was released without any charges. The same uh, friend of his who was Palestinian uh, arrested. He is still in prison and he has no recourse to any, any, um, any legal redress or any defense. That's a simple definition of apartheid, treatment of people because of uh, either the religion or because of the ethnicity or because they are different in this case the Palestinian and the Israelis mostly the Western media ignore the issue but this issue and they continue to support the Israeli treatment of the Palestinian sometimes they may be critical they're just dressing up the propaganda there's nothing genuinely to con uh, condemn the Israeli government at any time that either international uh, courts have tried to highlight the issue of the apartheid or condemn the treatment of the Palestinians. And guess what? All the media and the, and the government of the United States and Europe, all of them have been backing the Israeli treatment of the Palestinians. In the same way that we uh, have the um, Israeli apartheid uh, system in place, uh, we also have to face the reality that the Islamist movement and Hamas are... Uh, segregationist movement, the reactionary movement, they want annihilation and destruction of the all the Jews and the Palestinians, all the Jews and Israelis in, in, in Israel. They cannot contemplate and is not part of the program to accept that there would be a Jewish state or a state that incorporates both uh, Palestinians and the, uh, and, the, and the Jewish people. Everybody knows there's 7.5 million people Palestinians, 7.5 million people Israelis. None of them are going to go away. None of them are going to here to stay. They will stay no matter what. You have to find a solution. We have on one hand, we have the Israeli uh, uh, right wing religious groups. On the other hand, we have the, we have the um, Hamas religious and Islamist groups. They are the ones who actually would not allow any dissent in, in, in Palestine. They would treat any dissent and um, opposition to uh, themselves with brute force. And that's how it actually originally took power in Gaza. You remember how they started killing the PLO supporters, executed many, and they, they took power with support of the Israeli government. They took power in in Gaza. And that's the thing that we need to face and we need to be able to deal with. And it's impossible to uh, um, to deal with the question of Palestine and to support Palestinian movement and the Palestinian cause, legitimate cause of the Palestinians, without opposing the terrorist, segregationist, uh, end of the world sort of religious cult of Hamas and Islamist movement. I mean, definitely, I mean, if we, you know, those of us who come from Iran and, you know, we've been battling the Islamic regime in Iran for many decades, we know the Islamists very well. And Hamas is part and parcel of that movement. I mean, it is a movement that denies women rights, women's autonomy. It uh, promotes Sharia laws. It is homophobic. It's anti-Semitic. It murders apostates and blasphemers. I mean, this is the reality of the Islamist movement anywhere, whether it's Iran, whether it's in the Palestinian territories. I think one of the problems is that very often they're seen as a revolutionary force in the same way that uh, the Islamic regime of Iran uh, could be seen as that by some. And in reality, they are a reactionary force. They are a force for the suppression of people's demands, desires, hopes. Uh, and so, in a sense, you know, it's obvious that uh, Hamas is not uh, is not a movement that can bring peace for the people of Palestine or Israel, of course, but because it is a movement of death and destruction, as the Islamists are. You know, Salman Rushdie did have a point. He he mentioned that you know people should look at 
what it will mean if Hamas takes over and Palestine, the occupation ends and Hamas takes over. But as you said, who put Hamas in place? It was the Israeli state. Uh, how did Islamism come to center stage? It was part of U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War. That's why we had an Islamic movement suppress the Iranian revolution, for example, and uh, take over and create an Islamic state. So, you know, we have to look at the usefulness of Islamism for both the Israeli state and Western government policy to this day. I think one of one of the things to say to uh, I think to continue on what Salman Rushdie said is well, you know yes Hamas is is Taliban like of course they are the Islamic Republic of Iran is Taliban like but uh, you can't put people in a situation where their entire society is annihilated that there's they're facing genocide starvation war you give no space for people to stand up to Hamas, to be able to dissent, like the woman life freedom revolution in Iran. You have, people need that space to be able to stand up and they can't under occupation and militarization and genocide and starvation. And so I think the question is, again, goes back to what you said at the beginning, which is neither Hamas nor Israeli state, neither have the best interests of either population, both populations in mind. Absolutely. I think the other point, uh, Mariam, is that uh, creation of uh, groups like Hamas it serves the interest of the right-wing religious uh, um, government of Israel. That's why they funded Hamas originally. They supported creation of Hamas against PLO because they don't didn't want a, uh, um, um, a Palestinian state, the possibility of Palestinian state, independent Palestinian state. And this fragmentation, creating opposition, it's part and parcel of a global strategic policy. Wherever we'll see the military uh, intervention by the United States, for example. You look at Iraq. What they did in Iraq, they started fragmenting and dividing people based on ethnicity and religions. What they did in Palestine, they started creating and supporting and backing various religious groups. Look at Syria. They started uh, backing religious, you know, different groups and, and Libya. They have never recovered from those intervention. And strategically, you'll see how the, in the interest of the uh, manipulation and control of the resources, there's always that fragmentation of societies so that people won't be able to organize and defend themselves. And that's, that's the thing that we need to highlight, uh, that the existence of groups like Hamas is part and parcel of that broader strategic uh, intervention in, in the Middle East. And the, the difficulty is that the treatment of the Palestinians, it sets the scene for the rest of the Middle East because the value of the Palestinian life is becomes the currency, the value of the people in Middle East. It, it becomes a standard bearer of what happens to the rest of the region. And, and I think that's beneficial to both the Islamists and the right-wing religious uh, groups in Israel and those who are running the strategy of uh, Western governments, particularly United States and European uh, governments, uh, the intervention in the Middle East. I think one of one of the main problems we have, I think, in addressing this issue is the fact that there is collective blame. Um, being um, imposed, it's sort of like a, a tribalistic collective revenge against a population that is collectively to blame for the crimes of those in power. So, for example, when Hamas attacks uh, concert goers in southern Israel, it is, you know, an act of resistance against occupation, as if the murder of people taking hostages, sexual violence, there is evidence of sexual violence by Hamas. And the Islamists always have used sexual violence and human humiliation, as has the Israeli side. So there's no denying that, that that didn't happen. That's one of their, they do it in the Islamic regime of Iran in their prisons. ISIS did it with its sex slaves. When you dehumanize people and you don't consider them human anymore, they are war booty, you can do whatever the hell you want with them. And that is exactly the way they view um, people on both sides. I think this sort of collective blame that it's fine to murder 
civilians who are going to a concert because they're to blame for what the Israeli occupation has done. And on the other side also we see that uh, Israel can go ahead and just annihilate an entire population, starve them to death, kill an entire generation because of what Hamas did on October 7th. Again, blaming an entire population for the crimes of those in power. Uh, and then the sort of tribalistic also revenge, you know, we are collectively going to avenge and it doesn't matter who dies in, in the process and how many people we kill. So I think in that sense, that, that, that uh, view, I think, has been very key in allowing the Israeli government to do what it wants to do. And also that allows Hamas and the Islamic regime and the Islamist movement, we can't just look at Hamas but the Islamic movement as a whole to do what it wants with impunity. Um, and I think it, it, it is uh, when we stop, when we stop collective blame and collective revenge is a moment when we can really begin to put real pressure on both sides. Because at this moment, there's so much justification and legitimization for this dehumanization of the other. And when it's when the other is dehumanized, you know, you can do whatever you want with them. You know, and you see this often historically as well, you know, the civil rights movement, for example, you know, black people, you know, there was this march of men and they were uh, and women and it says, I am a man, I am a human being. You know, this is so key in in beginning to see people's humanity. I think that's something we all have to do as people who believe in defending human humanity and seeing humanity as sacred is to humanize and to prevent the dehumanization on both sides. Yeah. Um, I think that that is really key. And the other issue really is, you know, when we talk about never again, never again, we hear it all the time. And I think actually what it means is again and again and again and again, as long as we can dehumanize the population enough, Really, anything can be done to them. And we're witnessing this now uh, on our TV screens. Um, uh, you know, so I think one, really one solution is the humanization of the other. Absolutely. And we need a, we need a different narrative. And I think a narrative that would capture the humanities on the ground. When we see people in... Uh, in Gaza, in Palestine, as real people, like uh, like everybody else who is actually watching those, and they have the right, full rights, not partial rights, not a, li a little bit of rights, not a different right, exactly the same right. Every child in Gaza, in occupied territory, has exactly the same right. And when we see people in in Israel also have exactly the same right, and they can, I mean, they, that's the other part, dehumanization of the. Um, of the Jews in in Israel by the Islamist movement uh, to, to deny them their existence and saying that they need to be wiped out uh, uh, completely and there should be an end to Israel. We need a different narrative that actually sees people, real people on the ground. And the other thing which is missing is solidarity. And I think that's so important that linking people up, I mean, the emergence of this solidarity between Palestinians and Israelis and the Arabs and the Jews in Palestine. And it's happened, actually. It's happening day in, day out in, in Palestine. But the right wing media does not allow that to uh, um, uh, to be portrayed. They want they don't want that narrative. Um, the, um, the standing together movement for example and the groups that are emerging in in israel who are supporting the humanitarian sort of uh, activities in jerusalem uh, supporting the trucks uh, aid trucks going against the religious right-wing groups all of that it's uh, evidence of the need of solidarity but one thing that was uh, striking for me that all of that all the support all the protests across the globe all the demands of the people are censored in israel you won't see much of that on israeli tv only through social media and the work of people like uh, standing together with the arab and israelis in uh, in israel that should actually either portraying and trying to get the news to uh, um, Israeli uh, population. And that's one of the issues that the domination of right wing media globally in Israel and globally, who actually prevents that different narrative, narrative of the uh, the third sort of 
alternative which is based on real human existence and uh, um, the narrative that creates solidarity for people to live in peace and without division and war.